don't sound too loud. I've started recording, guys. <laughs> yeah, don't give me anything. Right, okay, so. so welcome back to episode number two. So what's that? Back to back episodes. Um, I lie. So um, on this week's episode, we're gonna be covering um, starting off with first impressions. So first impression in a new environment, a new job, new team. Then we'll move back to hot topics. And one of the hot topics at the moment is our university degree is still relevant. Then we'll end with our book recommendation. We have a slight change to the book recommendation section. So stay tuned and let's get started. Take off, take flight with you. Yeah. We never fly, but we're flying. So... How's everyone doing? We're all good. Doing good, man. Not bad at all. It's been a yeah, long I just week. Have to pre-warn, just have to pre-warn everyone that I'm dialing in from Morocco and the Wi-Fi here is a bit shaky. So just a heads up. That's Mr. Alaikum, Some Mr. Alaikum, Mr. International. Wow. Yeah, just getting on flights, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I actually just landed. Yeah, you catch your flights and feelings, sure. <laughs> Maybe actually in, in Morocco, I've been wandering around. It's very easy to catch feelings here. So after this, I'll go out for dinner and have some fun. So let's, well, let's, get, into let's get into it. So let's start off with the first topic. So first impressions on a new job, new environment. Let's just have a free flowing conversation. Tips, ideas on how you guys make good sure first impression. I think the first thing to remember is you can't make a first impression twice. That's the one thing that always sticks in my mind. Duh, that's kind of contradicting. No, no. <laughs> Obviously, first impressions so, are the first time. <laughs> no, but people know. No, if you know, if you think about it, break it down. You can't make a first impression twice. So, therefore, be very, very careful on how you present yourself the first time round. Mm. For example, you might be going to a dinner with a, a, group, a large group of people. Are you going to really wear a tracksuit? Mm. You, know, you might want to be smartly dressed. So that's what I'm talking about. First impression. It's not just how you speak. Mm. It's also how you present yourself. It's good you mentioned that, you know that, because um, I was looking online and it says that um, first impressions are really dictated in the first 7 to 20 seconds of meeting someone. And they said that 55% of what people look at is your appearance. So it's not even what you say. 55% of how people decide a first impression is just how you look, like you mentioned, what you wear, um, how much confidence you have, how you carry yourself. Do you remember remember P at university always wearing his tracksuits? <laughs> yeah, day, day in, day in, day What's out. What's the point make with that? <laughs> and my point is when I first saw you at university, you know, my first impression was like, is this guy studying accounting or finance or is he here to play football? Hey, I'm not know, sure you know, which oh, one. <laughs> oh. Actually, to that point, actually, because I used to wear tracksuits a lot because they were convenient. Someone actually said to me once, do you study sports science? So to your point... You're actually right. Yeah, it does. It does have a big um, impact in, in the first impression. So, like, uh, if we go into, like, more specific um, in terms of work. So when you guys started Hello? your first job, um, how did you guys work on your first impressions and what were some of the things you did? Well, I can start from my internship um, back in 2010. And, you know, I was told that the environment was very relaxed. You didn't need to wear a tie, but something being a young black male always make sure that I not only dress correctly but sometimes even go over the top not over the top where I look like an idiot <laughs> but making sure that I don't let that standard drop so wearing a tie every day even if the manager says you don't have to wear a tie because okay you get familiar with your team but you might be seeing other people in the workplace that don't know you therefore you're making a first impression every single day mm. for you don't know how long and I remember talking to Pab, you know, we went into our full-time roles after university and they were talking about how we dress to work and, you know, talking about wearing a suit, a full suit every single day. And it wasn't because you feel comfortable wearing a full suit. It's because you're conscious of the fact that being young, being black, that often people have, you know, miss, they have, you know, they have preconceived, yeah. Yeah, preconceived yeah, preconceptions of you know, of how you might be, the way you might talk, the way you may act. So sometimes you need to make sure that all of these things are quickly discarded from their mind mm -hmm. and therefore making sure you have a very good first impression, leaving a good lasting impact on the person so that when they, when you leave their presence, they can think, oh, that person was, you know, 
pleasant, articulate, well-dressed, well-mannered young person. Not that you're trying to be someone you're not, but it's just being aware of your surroundings and adapting to your surroundings to make sure you put yourself in the best possible position, but also it will have effect on the way they think about other young black males also. Yeah. I think think you mentioned an interesting point there about um, the environment, and I think first impressions also are dependent on what kind of environment has been created. You guys obviously know about my internship experience and what it was like for the first <laughs> Are you sure you want to share that story? Are you yeah, sure you want to that, share that story? On that one. Just a whole the... episode on that go one. Go on, go on, go on, go on. Just to give the listeners a little bit of a flavour. Um, so basically walked into a, a situation where, uh, really young, trying to make a really good impression because it was my first internship, first working experience. Uh, you want to tick the box, you want to get your 45 days in because that's what, the, that's what the university says you need to do in order to um, graduate. And no, imagine, imagine being in a situation where there's no onboarding. Um, from the very beginning, you're just thrown into the deep end and hardly any support. And you're working with managers who panic a lot. And so it's then, how do you then make a good impression when the structure is, or the environment is not set up for you necessarily to succeed? So um, it, was, it was an interesting experience. I mean, it turned out to be one of my most valuable experiences because of how it's built me on moving forward. But I think sometimes you may not get the opportunity to make a good first impression in the beginning. However, you just have to stick in there and, and be resistant and then you perhaps will shine at a later stage. Mm. For sure. It's um, like, I like, so I think you talked about like the dressing well and just basically going through, like you mentioned, P, the tough situations. I think with my internship, one of the key aspects I think with um, first impression is really your attitude. If I take my yeah. internship, I remember a story. I started day one, so arrived 8 a.m. in the morning, extremely early because it was my first day, so, you know, didn't want to be late. And I didn't have a laptop, and um, my manager came over to me and said, hey, Olu, we've got a global global meeting, global call. Would you like to present? And this was probably an hour into my internship. Didn't know what we were going to talk about. Didn't know what the meeting was about. But automatically, I said yes. So that attitude of a, like a can-do attitude. Um, now, <laughs> I'm not going to front and pretend like the meeting went well. It was probably <laughs> my worst presentation. <laughs> like before the meeting, I got a pen and paper and wrote down every single thing I was going to say. And I just read it as quick as possible. I'm probably sure no one is that, that what call. Is that, is, that, is that what you're doing now? No, no, no. Now I've, I've been able to master that over years, you know. Don't be a hater. <laughs> but it was the worst presentation of my life. But I remember my manager afterwards took me aside and said, look, presentation was awful, but your attitude and the fact that it was your first day and you said yes, always keep that sort of can-do attitude because then people will continuously give you more responsibilities, coach you, teach you, and they'll see you as that sort of person that doesn't shy away from opportunities. So my sort of big thing about first impression is just that can do attitude yeah i think olu um that's something that i that i really resonate with as well about the can do and trying to be as positive of a person as possible because i think everyone has worked in teams where there's maybe one or two members who are more negative complaining about everything or just kind of draining the room and especially with the first impression if you come in with an uplifting personality open and for me the biggest thing is just being authentic i think Sometimes, in especially when you're meeting people for the first time, it can be very easy to be a bit more stiff or a bit uncomfortable and a bit more not yourself. Mm. But I think the best first impressions are the ones where you can come in and you can leave an impact and you can just be yourself from day one. But of course, in certain environments, be a bit more professional. I think for me, if I think about when I um, moved to Japan, so the Japanese culture is very receptive, very respectful, respectful. Um, but they're not necessarily the most open at the beginning. So I went there and I tried to be as authentic as I could. And I didn't want to go there with some arrogant attitude like, oh, here's this guy who's come through, come, come from company HQ who thinks he knows everything. I tried to go there positive, open-minded, and look, I'm here to support and help you guys. And I think coming with that positive, humble um, approach really helped them open up to me and build some great relationships as well. And I think this is something that, I was able to experience not just in Japan, but even before that, I think in the last, I was trying to count before the podcast, I think in the last six and a half years, I've 
worked in five different roles and had seven different line managers. So you can imagine that's a lot of different first impressions. You during those people. during those experiences, did you find any areas? Because a lot of first impressions, like you mentioned, is culture, like culture. So culturally, one thing you might seem that might seem normal to you might seem off in another culture. Did you ever experience any negative first impressions based on cultures or anything like that? Um, I remember probably on my first day when I first started my Novartis role, um, I came in and typical me at that time, I was wearing a three-piece suit, a very bright purple tie. <laughs> typical, and I had typical a pocket Shuel. Shuel. Typical. Typical Shuel, especially 2012 Shuel. And I walk in, I think my manager at that time, he didn't have a tie on. Um, and I think... I should have been a bit more cautious and maybe not overdressed as much. I remember the first day... You basically bit... outdress your manager. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit awkward. I remember the first day was a bit awkward. But I mean, to be honest, I was being authentic. That was me at that time. <laughs> but I mean, on that first day, it was a bit... Un... Not uncomfortable, but what probably wasn't as smooth. We were able to develop a much better relationship afterwards. But that's probably the only experience I can think of a first impression. I mean, I've had job interviews where it's been a complete disaster before the company that I'm working in now, where... First impressions were already terrible, but yeah. Apart from that, within my company now, not so much. How about you? Have you guys? But, had any but, I, but I think we're I think we we're, we're focusing a bit too much on workplaces. I think you know one thing to note is we make first impressions every single day mm. with yeah, people. Great point, great point, you know, yeah. we we meet new people every single day um, in our you know in our commute to work, going to the shop, going to a restaurant. So you know some things that I would say how well what would make a good first impression is. Of course, being confident and speaking very clearly, hmm. but yeah. also good hygiene is very important. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, know, you want to be, you want to be well groomed, especially you when have, you're on that underground. You don't want to be yeah, getting close have, to someone that hasn't brushed their teeth. Fresh, <laughs> you want to have fresh, trying to hold your breath. I don't know if you guys face the same thing. No, but... no, no, bro. that's you. Nah, yeah, I don't bro. know who you're referring boy, to. Yeah. I like, yeah, boy, yeah. it's funny because it only happens when I'm around you guys. But never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know a smile goes a long way just smiling you know walking down the street you just smile at someone it can sometimes just make someone's day by smiling at them if you're then talking in like a more corporate environment you know giving a firm handshake and one thing i always try and do wherever i am when i say hello to someone is whether it's at a concierge whether it's at a restaurant my waiter you know every time i go to a restaurant i always ask for the waiters or waitress's name because i don't like to to say excuse me i like to address them by name say excuse me for example or yeah, excuse me Rich, can i um, have some more water please so even when i'm being greeted at the entrance and when i leave i would say thank you very much have a lovely evening and then their name just to add what you mentioned i think uh, energy i think energy levels i think is really really if you can walk into a situation where you sort of raise the energy levels i think that's always really really appreciated from the people that are around and to your point around the listening i think something i, I came across the other day which was to be more interested than interesting and so that shows mm. like that engagement the person you're speaking to um getting to know their first name and addressing them on a personal basis and i think those two in addition to what you said also um can can really help with first impressions I would like to understand from you guys. Um, Shawal, you use the word authentic quite a lot. Yeah. And do you guys ever find that authentic and first impressions or trying to have a brand can conflict and you feel sometimes fake based on your first impression? Have you guys ever been through that, experienced that, or do you see those challenges? Yeah, it's a big... Anyway, okay. Yes, yeah, so this is a good topic. Call because especially as black people, let's be honest... <laughs> Everyone, have you guys heard of the terminology, your white voice? Like every black person has got a white voice. Like yeah. this, that's a part of first impression. Cause even when I talk to some people at work, I've got to be careful of certain yeah. words I use or slang that I use where like, oh, that's dope. And I'm like, okay, can I use that? Would that person understand that? <laughs> but, Would they but, think, oh. But that, but but that, you also, know comes down to, that also comes down to adapting to your surroundings. But I would how say. Do, I'm not like, saying you're not being authentic, but, but you're, yeah, being, exactly. appropriate, you're also, being appropriate. But how do you have that balance? How do you have yeah, that balance also, between authentic and adapting? Go on, Pete, Pete, Pete's bringing his authentic stuff up. No, 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 no. I also, <laughs> no. I also think it's how comfortable you are with yourself. So I, I yeah, that yeah. at the beginning of, of our careers, we are really trying to fit in, right? Mm. As opposed to, uh, and we're trying to be accepted as opposed to accept me how I am. So as Afro-Caribbean, we know we speak a lot of slang. We're coming from ends and we know in order to sort of progress in the corporate ladder from what we understand we need to speak a certain way 
Pete, you're so, kind of becoming more authentic as these podcasts come along. He's getting his voice right. <laughs> so, so I think in the beginning, I think in the early stages, I think there's a lot of trying to be perhaps something you're not. With a touch of trying to refine yourself, and I think, I think nowadays, perhaps maybe you guys can agree. I think we're a lot more. You're finding that comfort spot, which is a balance between who you are, kind of how people know you at home, and also the right fit for for the corporate space. Mm. Now, I just for myself, I've I can even tell certain times when I was traveling and I had work colleagues in my car. I've got to be conscious about what music I'm playing. I'm not gonna play some certain hip hop songs in the car because I'm like, yo, are they going to feel uncomfortable? You know, I just always, that's one area that I always try to think about. How do I get that right balance of being comfortable and saying, okay, this is what I like, but then making sure that, or making sure that the person's not stereotyping you based on their preconceived notions. But it comes down to, like I said, adapting to your environment. It's like saying, I'm not going to talk the way I'm talking now. If I'm in Nigeria, Am I now not being my authentic self? I'm just adapting to the environment that I'm in so that I can be understood easily. True. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you I know? and I think and I think doing what Daniel's saying, adapting to your environment doesn't necessarily, in my view, mean you're being inauthentic either. Like the way that I talk to you guys is slightly li- different to how I talk to my parents. And I think the the older we get, the more experienced is that we have the more first impressions that we make the more confidence we build in ourselves yeah. and once we have more more and more confidence we're in more environments where we walk into a room and we don't know anyone and we have to really introduce ourselves again over and over that really builds that confidence in you anyway after a while so i think all of us from the experiences of being in new environments new countries meeting new people it builds yeah. that confidence to be authentic so in my view if we adapt from one room of people to another that doesn't necessarily mean it's inauthentic as long as you're respectful like you're saying Olu, as long as you're not playing a meek mill going in track when you've got other <laughs> colleagues or like 50 60 plus in the car then that's cool but i think that's just being respectful rather than being fake or something like that um now that's good to understand you guys views what do you guys think about brand because first impression truly leads into your brand and you setting your brand who you are as a person who people identify you as so what do you guys think about brands and give us some examples of how you set a good brand? I think, so I actually had this conversation with um, a guy within the company that I work in because we've just introduced this reverse mentoring and we were talking about social media and how this impacts um, the people of today and the next generation of leaders coming through. So I think in my view, the way that personal branding is, I think beforehand you had your professional, professional life, rah, serious notifications. You had your professional life and then you had your private life. And before there was no, none of the social media, which kind of mixed the two. Then there was a period probably when we were at university was, or when we were first starting working professionally. You had your kind of corporate who you were and then you had your private social media life. So it was, it was still you had these two individual lives, but they weren't mixing at all. I think in the last six years and if, people like Gary V, um, how Instagram is blowing up and all these influencers influencers on the business side and CEOs of companies now really integrating into the digital landscape. I see now branding as being one. So rather than having these two separate lives in professional or private or social media in real life, everything is being meshed into one. So now I see social media as a tool which you can use to improve your brand. So the work that you're doing at work you can share that on an internal social sites. Like we have Yammer within our company, which is kind of like a Facebook for a corporate environment. But you can also share some of the insights on LinkedIn, for example, where you're reaching out to your colleagues at your company and also professional colleagues outside. You can share learnings on Instagram, etc. And the way that I see it is, if I was to apply for a job now in a different company, they probably will look at my CV on one hand. And then naturally, I'm sure the HR person or whoever would type in my name on Google see maybe my Instagram or my LinkedIn page, and then they can maybe see certain messages I'm conveying on that, which if I'm controlling <laughs> in the right way, I can try and help position myself even better for another job. It's funny you say that, so, um, Shua, because it's really perception becomes reality, right? Like whatever so. perception people have. You know what? Let's do something fun. I think this would be a good idea. Does, do all of you guys have your phone on you, your mobile on you? Yeah. Yep. yeah yeah why don't we do a thing where we go to everyone's instagram page like she well said whatever you put out there is your brand and we'll go to each person's page 
And I just want to want the rest of us 30 seconds based on looking on their page. What do you see? What is their brand? What is their image based on their <laughs> social media? I think that would be right. Curated by DJ. Curated by DJ. Let's go to it. Yes, private account. Don't try and follow me if I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shua, are you on it? So, okay, three finally. words that I would describe Daniel if I didn't know him and I was looking through his page. So, I would think one... Um, devoted husband. Two, I would say um, well traveled. Um, he's clearly been around the world. And three, I would say I get the impression of a very positive and happy man because he's smiling in a lot of his pictures. <laughs> no, I'm, spon- I, I, no, I'm, I'm sponsored by Colgate. No, I agree. Okay, so let's move on to P, Pabs. So I would say he's trying to be. He was trying to be di- he's trying to be discreet but at the same time loud. I say that because when you look at his his image, it's just a white screen. Okay. It's got no photo, no mm. kind of indication of who this guy is. But when Seems you look at the mysterious, feed mysterious, yeah. When you look at the feed, I see someone who is establishing a page which features travelling with yeah. lifestyle and motivation. Mm. Um someone who is not being too flashy, flamboyant, Floyd Moe style. But showing, you know, traveling places he's traveled to, but as well, at the same time sharing deep insights into lessons learned along the way. And yeah, for me, I if, I did, if I didn't know him, it would be a motivation. Be, okay, this guy's been traveling. Okay, you know, what does he do on, a, on his day job? Because, you know, from his post, it looks like he's traveling every so often. So I want to know, okay, what does he do? How does he sustain this lifestyle? How does he create such yeah. a lifestyle for himself? So yeah, that's how I'd wrap it up into. Man DM, likes, DM me in it. DM man. me for details, and I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Pete, I, 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 don't you? Okay, so let's move on man to Shuwao. Well. So we'll go to Shuwao's page. I think looking at your page, Shuwao, well, um, I think it's very neat. You know, the way just looking straight at it, you could tell. Okay, this is a person that likes to travel, um, likes to connect, likes to invest. I think it's straight to the point. Um, it looks like you're uh, some sort of marathon runner. It looks like you got quite a few pictures recently of you running marathons. Um, I get also the family connection. I see quite a lot of pictures with you and family. So I'll tie it into like three things. You're someone really focused on health and fitness because I see a lot of videos of you working out. Someone that's family oriented. And then lastly, really like trying to provide motivational content for investing and yeah investing and traveling yep that's what i get from you okay last but not least we'll go Wally. to my page <laughs> so, right, so let's look at mr wale she called wale, wale. Wale. So senior senior finance manager creator of the bottom line <laughs> <laughs> exploring his whole life in one sentence a lot <laughs> So what I, so if I just scroll up and down really quickly, what I get a sense of is someone that is an advocate traveller, is very in tune with his family, He's got a lot of pictures actually with family and grandmother and okay. Um, he loves himself. There's a lot of pictures of, of, of himself. <laughs> <laughs> Self-love is important. Self-love Keep is important. Elbow, watch out. <laughs> I lie. <laughs> No, someone actually, I think it's very fulfilled. Someone living, someone trying to live the life to its fullest. So, let's move on to the next section. So, hot topic. <music> Seeing a lot of information and news around university, the potential of them increasing university costs and university price. It would be good if we have a conversation with you guys on if university is still relevant, if it's the same, would you guys, if you had the option, go back to university? Let's just have an open dialogue about university yeah. and if it's still relevant. Yeah, so I think I think uh, what needs to happen more often is, is um, I think parents need to have a hard conversation with their uh, children or, and vice versa to understand what is actually a goal, what are you really trying to achieve? Because you can get to that point without university, without a degree. Um, and so right now, if I just quickly, before we, we can go around, 
the biggest benefit I see with going to university is really access and the people that you actually get to um, network, like how we've become friends and bonded us four here. And so it's, um, yeah, so those are the points in mind. I would say it's, it depends on what you want to do. If you're going to be something specialised, a doctor, a dentist, an architect, these are all professions where training is required to be under you know, the wing and under the guidance of someone who is successful in that field. It's definitely required. Mm. But if you're going to do, I don't want to say something more creative, but you know, with the up and rise of social media and influencers, YouTubers, bloggers and blaggers, and all sorts. <laughs> it's, it, you, people, you know, people, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. People are making some serious money. So you've got to ask yourself in 10 years time, is a degree in something such as say, um, let's say media. Ooh. Let's say, no, I'm not trying to shoot down a media degree. I'm just Yo, saying- I did well, media. Why are you saying I'm a media? No, I, I, did, I, did media I, did, I did media A level. <laughs> but I'm gonna, I'm saying, would a degree in such, such as media in 10 years time be so relevant where you could be someone who finishes college, high, um, yeah, finishes high school, college, goes and learns, becomes a runner, starts, you know, gets a, a camera, starts learning how to use a camera, learns how to operate and record and edit. Okay, you might learn some a few additional things, but are these things that are theoretical in a practical environment? Would you gain more from being doing it practically than theoretically? Mm. That's the, something you need to ask yourself. And with the way people are are moving these days in careers and professions that they even creating for themselves on YouTube and social media, do you have a better advantage by just going straight into that mm. as opposed to racking up 30, 40,000 pound worth of debt that you have to pay back and also trying to find a creative job? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to, I'm, that's just, I'm just, I'm just saying. Um, yeah, because I was thinking, I think now I, I read also in the news recently, like companies such as Google and I think one other tech company they're taking away university requirements now in some of their roles for, um, I think, engineering jobs or something. So if people have had already like a startup environment or experience, then they'll actually weigh that application more now than someone who's maybe just gone to university and mm. not had the same relevant experience. So I think from I, I think the way education is going, it's A, it's becoming more expensive, which we're all aware. I think now my brother who's at university, he's paying triple the tuition fee of what I paid when I was at university and I was at university only 10 years ago so he's now going to be leaving university with three times the debt that I did mm. um, and is the education really that much that much better I think the way that I see it is yeah yeah if you're trying to become a doctor or lawyer as Daniel says you need to get the education but it's becoming more and more important about getting the relevant work experience alongside your degree or even skipping university and going straight into the work if you know that you're already good at a certain area or um you've got you've got a great opportunity to try something in a certain area yeah. maybe that's it's, awesome. it's one of those things where it's the way i think of it is i think you guys covered it perfectly but it's we're changing the way we look at education and career now previously when we all were growing up it was university is the path university is the way yeah now no, they now they've got stuff like apprenticeships where Instead of you going to university and taking that debt, you can decide to specialize in a specific area. So when I think about that decision, you need to ask yourself really, one, are you willing to take the cost that it costs um, for you to go to university? Maybe you're not sure about what you specifically want to specialize in. But if you do know what you want to specialize, like you want to specialize in plumbing, uh, media, or um, even some accounting aspects, Maybe you can go directly down the route of an apprentice and learn some specialized skill versus going through that path of university. And I'm seeing a change towards those apprenticeships sort of path. Um, what do you guys think about that? Are you seeing that? Do you guys know well, anyone that's done apprenticeships? Yeah, my company, we, we do apprenticeships now. We started three years ago and someone would come for a year do an apprenticeship and some, some of them have stayed on for full-time roles, in fact. But... I, I just wanted to draw, so, I wanted to state some facts in terms of, for example, someone who doesn't need a degree versus someone who gets a degree and salaries, you know, for example, someone who, such as a teacher, you know, teachers we rely on to educate our children or, you know, even young ones, cousins, etc. We've also been educated by teachers and the average salary of a teacher is about 37,000. Mm. And I want to say that compared to, for example, a bricklayer, that's 42,000. 
No, we pay. Our, we all know we pay our teachers way. Yeah, like, it's very, it's very under, bad. Underpaid for what they provide, and the for fact a, that they're supposed to yeah, for grow the arch- next generation. Yeah, for a graduate architect, it's thirty-eight thousand. A dentist, about forty thousand. You compare that to ones where a, a degree is not needed and people going straight from school, uh, college, bricklayer, forty-two thousand. Like I said, roofer, forty-two thousand three hundred. An electrician, forty-seven thousand, and a plumber, forty-eight thousand. And comparing that to subjects and degrees that people would get incur debt and then go into the workplace you've already seen that someone who's become a bricklayer could really be earning a lot more than you yeah. three four years into your career yeah. and for example i'm not even gonna lie i can't i, I can't do any electrics i can't do any plumbing but you told me there's something <laughs> wrong with my boiler you told me something that's something wrong with my boiler and oh, someone yeah. comes and says come and says 200 pound i'm not gonna say i'm not gonna pay you 200 pound they probably charge me a thousand. I'm not going to say no. I'm trying to say if there is something that needs to be done, you're not going to necessarily argue because mm, yeah, they're in yeah. demand. And as time goes on and people go and get degrees, these yeah. professions are less represented and therefore think, they can um, charge a higher price. I, go ahead, Pete. Yeah, no, I was, I was one of the points that's coming to mind is I think it's also quite unfortunate where you, just to answer, I think, Olu's question. It's also quite unfortunate where you see students sort of being force fed uh, a university degree and they get to their second year and they realize uh, this is not for me. Um, Mm. And then they kind of maybe not have wasted two years because they might have learned a bit more about themselves. But in some cases, I think people need to start looking at universities and apprenticeships as maybe more favorable because it's more flexible, it's less time. So you may not need four years to be in in an educational setup. You may only need six months, a year, two years, and then you can get going. Mm. So, um, Keeping in mind, I think that, I think we should be much more open to sort of having more flexible courses. But what do you uh, think is stopping that? What is do you think is stop? Because I have one friend of mine. Too much money. I think. I don't think it's just the money. You know, I don't just think it's the money. But okay, put put it this way: how all of us, okay, apart from the the great people we've met at university and the friends we've made for for life, what that we studied at uni for our degrees do we use in our in our in our work in our workplace? But. I think but I work think is not just way. about what you study. It's all about the life experiences as well. <laughs> no, you're not trying to... You're not trying to go around that question. No, no, no. I'm saying it's not just what you learn, but... but I know, of course, it's not what you learn, but I'm trying to say, in terms of the theory and the lectures, the lectures that we had, what we're ultimately paying for, hmm. what did we exactly extrapolate from that? Of course, you know, time management and managing deadlines and certain and number of projects is, is time management skills, okay. But when we say what the theory and the things we learnt in university no, I'll no, say you definitely yeah. learn more on the job you learn more on the job versus what you learn that's in what, university that's what I'm trying to say our degrees exactly I relevant. agree with you but I'm saying why hasn't that changed guys because if I look at certain data right now and it shows even we look at apprenticeships or whatever if we look at apprenticeships right now let's talk even like Asian and black people as that's what we are black people only make 3% of people that do apprenticeships yeah um, Asian people, I think, only make four percent of people that do apprenticeships. Why is that number so low? Because personally, I think yeah, it's because of parents because and the generation. You know, but are they doing careers? Or are they going into apprenticeships that require apprenticeships? For example, you want to, you there are certain things that you would go to do an apprenticeship. And let's not take away the fact that an apprenticeship is you you're working for four days and then on like one day a week you're going into college to study. Yeah. So there is an element of studying. But these professions or these careers that would come from an apprenticeship. The question is, do black people want them in the first place for the numbers to be high? No, I think I think it's I do a, it's think they do of... want it. I just feel like it's more parenting, bro. I think it's like if I talk about my, my friend yeah, one guy I know, he basically after college he came home and he said, I don't want to go to university. He said that to his parents, yeah? Nigerian household. They were like, <laughs> what do you mean you're not going to university? You have to go to university. He's like, no, I just don't think it's right for me. I found this apprenticeship um, I really want to go down this specific route. And he, it was so difficult for him to convince his parents to say, okay, this is not what I believe is right for me. And I want to go down the path of being an apprentice. And he's doing fantastic right now. And he's accelerated. He's had promotion after promotion. But I just feel like culturally and with our parents, they sometimes struggle, especially when you come from a minority background, to be more open to another alternative path versus university. Yeah, no, Olu, I agree. I think that's the point I was going to make. It's, it's the parents are playing, they're always playing and they have been playing in survival. So I think the reason why those numbers are low for the apprentice uh, in, in the black and brown communities is because our parents, I mean, in their eyes, once you're at university, they've done their job. Mm. And so 
Uh, it's a very traditional way of thinking. And that goes back to the first, the first point I was making. I think tough discussions need to, be, need to be had in the household in terms of what the child actually wants to go in and do, because there's other ways to, to get there, not just the university route. Mm. But also, I'm, uh, just in terms of a, a degree nowadays, how much weight does that carry? Okay, you've got an undergrad degree, you've got a master's, you've got a master's, but yeah, does yeah. that... But I know people that have got a degree, got a master's, are still struggling to get a job. Mm-mm. They're struggling to go into something that they really enjoy. So when they are, when they do get the job, they might be at a kind of an entry level salary. Yeah, the, you're, you're thirty, early thirties, yeah. but you're not earning what someone may have been earning should they've been in that role for three, four years. So you know, when it, I'm not trying to devalue degree, I've got a degree, and I wouldn't be in the the job I'm in today without the degree. Mm. Not at the time I applied anyway. But you could, you could be doing better without the degree. I, yeah, I could be doing better. I could, I could, I could, yeah, that's true. I could be doing better. I could be doing worse. I could be an influencer. I could be a blogger and a blagger. Who knows? But more likely to be a blagger. Talk for yourself. <laughs> but no. But it's it's coming to a point where degrees are becoming so common that it's not valued. Yeah, in, I think in my eyes. But I, I think I think that's also the the trending view in the world, especially you know where we see Instagram and all these people building these amazing careers. But I think one question that we need to do is if we take a step back, what's kind of long term sustainable and what makes sense for the individual? So building on some of the points about the question that Olu said of what's kind of holding ethnic minorities on holding them back and getting apprenticeships and stuff. I think it really, as P says, it really depends on the parents and the generation. I think from my own experience my parents didn't get the opportunity to even go to university so for them me going to uni was the only choice if I didn't go to university that was just life over their life would have just been a complete failure so that I had no choice to not go to university and I had to go and for me at the time it made sense now I have other family friends where um, education wise they weren't so strong and there's an, uh, one of my younger cousins um did an apprenticeship. He's also Asian, obviously, and he did an apprenticeship to be um, a work experience working in a mechanic in the garage as a mechanic. And now he's it's been what well, like probably six, seven, eight years now where he's been working in the garage and he's worked himself up to the point where he's basically running the whole thing himself. Hmm. I, I even don't even I don't even know why he hasn't opened his own garage, which I'm trying to push him to do in the next couple of years because he's got the knowledge and stuff. And he's someone who maybe in the old classical system would not have done so well at university, mm. but because he took that apprenticeship, his parents were open-minded enough for him to try it. And mm. um, now his career has flourished and he hasn't got the debt. He's got a great Mercedes car as well that I've seen him drive around. <laughs> but, um, but then... Sure, well, I'll just and, add there, yeah, because I think yeah. you can continue, but I'll add there. You mentioned about your cousin where he wasn't academically as good as you. But I just want us to be clear that there's also some people that do do the um, apprentice route who are doing academically well, but just feel oh, yeah, like that's sure, the path sure, they want to sure. take versus sure. versus other. Because I feel like that's also a taboo where when I was growing up and I heard um, apprenticeships, I was like, I guess that person's not doing that well. In And that's not true. It's just it yeah, just needs a true. whole new true. branding. I think apprenticeships and not going to university just needs a whole new branding. And people, yeah. Yeah. people look down on them. People yeah. look down on apprenticeships. Not right. It's not. It's not right at all because yeah. there was a, there was someone in uh, my in my office place, in my in my workplace a few years ago. Uh, he did an, He finished his apprenticeship two years ago, and he did his apprenticeship uh, within my department. And he said, "Oh, uh, he wasn't sure whether to go to university, but he decided to take you out and do an apprenticeship and then decide." And I was like, "Okay, um, so what are you thinking of doing?" He said, "He well, university. He wants to do some some." like um, some mad, um, more advanced than further maths and economics. And I said, oh, okay, why didn't you go into it this year? He goes, oh, because he missed one grade. And this guy got like, this. he's a, it was a, he's a black boy. He got like a, a two-way stars and an A or something. I think he needed like three-way stars, something crazy. So he certainly wasn't stupid. He wasn't dumb. He was very bright. But yet he decided to do an apprenticeship. He then did the apprenticeship and went to university. He's come back every year for summer internships as well. So I'd say that to say because we often assume people that do apprenticeships aren't ad- academically gifted, but they can be. And sometimes they're unsure whether they want to go into work full time or go on to university. So it's almost like doing, like doing a gap year, but it can also be in a professional environment where they can pick up new skills, learn new things, meet new people and see what it's like to work in, say, an office environment or in as an under as a plumber or an electrician. Mm. But what does university, like, so being a devil's advocate, what does, 
because I think we all sort of mentioned how we feel like for some people it might make more sense not to go to university. What are some of the like true benefits of university now that people are paying nine yeah, k for it? I think I think universities will always have a place for a, a, a platform to establish great networks, right? So I wouldn't have met you guys if I didn't go to university. So if I had to argue for universities, I would say it's a, a great place to to meet new people. Uh, you could have your future business partner there. Your future wife could be at university. Um, and it's a chance to groom and refine yourself. So those, are, for me, are the two strongest points that I would say that are for. So if you think it's worth paying 27000 to do that, then good idea. Yeah, and I think if I, if I think back to when I was 18, if at 18 you told me, okay, you can either go to uni or here's um, 10K, go figure out what you want to do. I don't know if at 18 I would have the right tools or mindset to do something. Uh, with that 10k and turn it into something that I have now in terms of the financial income and assets, etc. So I think it really depends if at that age, if you already have an idea or you have a drive to try something, then yeah, maybe take a break from uni or skip it for a couple of years and give it a shot. But if I think in my own personal circumstance at 18, I don't think I had the right tool set. So going to university and learning the skills that Pavila just said, being in an international environment and being around people who are very ambitious from different parts of the corner. That drove me and helped guide me to at the age of 21, 22, having a better idea of what I wanted to do. So for me, university made a lot of sense because I didn't really know what I wanted and it helped develop that later on, so. I, I think, just another point that came to mind, I think it's also how the, because it's access to opportunity. So our parents uh, saw it as a chance where if you enter this institution, you're going to uh, meet new people and then that will take you on to then building a career. If we think about ourselves and, and raising our families, we see ourselves putting, let's say, having more opportunities to provide to our children. So mm -hmm. would we actually advise our children also to go to universities, given how we see us building our lives and opportunities? So I think it's, I think it's a lot to do with access to opportunity. Yeah, this is why it's important for people in our minority, in our backgrounds, to have the conversation that we're having now. Not just mm -hmm. people in mm -hmm. university, but people outside of university, we have friends who haven't gone to university and have had ex having a great career or supporting their family. So this is why it's important for people like us to have these conversations with our peers, with our friends, with our family, even with our parents, with our younger siblings, and to take this all into account when hopefully one day we've got our own kids and we can then make a more informed decision rather than you have to go to university because that's the only choice. Because really that is not the only choice anymore. So it's something that we should all be conscious of. And this is why these conversations are great and why this podcast is a great idea. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. So moving on to the next section, we'll now go to the book recommendation. I'm going to pass this over to Pabs, Pabilo. Um, yes. He's going to give us his book recommendation and we're just going to ask Pete. questions and try to get a better understanding. Got the cool. shotgun ready, Pete. Got the shotgun ready. Yeah, loaded, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fully. Uh, so, so, yes, the book I want to recommend and have a discussion around this week is a book that's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a F-U-C-K. Some of you may or some of you in the call may have um, read it. But I think Great choice. it's, it's uh, so this, it's in it's in the self-help arena and it's uh, it's all about the approach, the counter counterintuitive approach to living a, a good life, right? And so the the author mark uh, Mark Manson spends time debunking the myths around mindless positivity is not a practical way to live life, right? And that there's yeah. more meaning in, in suffering um, and versus constantly trying to be happy. So I'll just pick out a few points from a couple chapters and then we can uh, discuss. So it's, um, but no, so it, a lot of, a lot of self-help books talk a lot about what you, they teach you a lot about what you can gain and what you can try to achieve. And this book is a lot about what you need to sort of, um, lose and, and let go in order to be in order to to find another level of, of happiness um one interesting perspective he mentioned was that when we sometimes when we spend more time um trying to be too positive it's actually focuses more on what we actually lack so for example people will talk about oh i need to get more money i need to chase more money you kind of didn't highlight the fact that you don't have enough right mm -hmm. or he said that you're looking in the mirror and you're and you're saying to yourself oh i'm beautiful um, i'm really good looking you're also highlighting the fact that you're you're not right, and so it's it's kind of being aware of 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 this and and keeping that um, as a perspective. 
Um, so he's. It's also a lot to do with not giving. Not not giving fuck is about uh, not trying to necessarily be different, but being comfortable with being di- with different. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that goes back the- to like the authentic point, no? Like being comfortable with who you are. So and how different you are, and just being comfortable in your own skin—is that the sole way to think of that? I'll say so for sure. Uh, for sure, I think I think it's a lot to do with. I, I think especially in the new age now, where you talk a lot about um, happiness and, and happiness, and yes, that's that's a key point. He's not he's not steering away from that, but I think he's just trying to bring in a much more um, thoughtful process around it and, and, and a better perspective. Okay. And then there's there's two actually a um, couple of the points. There was one. Uh, yeah, so in, in I think in chapter two was it was quite interesting. It was talking about um, life itself is a form of suffering, and and that's where we actually um, gain the most amount of meaning from. And um, happiness comes from solving problems. So when you end one, when you when you solve one problem, it's the beginning of another one. Mm-hmm. And sometimes going back to the point, if your if your sort of mind if your sort of mindless happiness, you can sometimes just make out like nothing's wrong. And I'll just try to avoid um, um, failure. Trying to avoid failure is failure in itself, right? And so it's um, it's a really, really, really strong, strong um, um, wait, point. Wait, wait. Can, can we can we do a rewind? Can you say that again, please? Because that was something you went over that a bit hit, too quick. That hit my soul. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to avoid failure is failure in itself. Mm. Mm. And, and and two two other points, real quick, and then we can um, discuss. One thing I like um, that really stuck out stuck out to me was he mentioned about choosing um, your struggle. So, for example, a lot of times people would ask you questions, what do you want in life? And the common answer is, you know, happy family, um, you know, a big house, cars, etc. But what you fail to miss or, 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 or think about is, what are you prepared to suffer for in order to have that? What are you prepared to, to go through the pain in order to achieve what you've just mentioned? So it's, it's, it's bringing in that balanced perspective and not just being yeah. so loopy in there and saying, oh, I want everything, etc. So, and the very last, the very, very last piece that uh, stuck up to me was um, about values. So he he believes a lot of the reasons why people um, um, sort of maybe get it wrong or, or is because they're placing the values on the wrong things. So, for example, if you if your value is always to be right, then you miss out the opportunity to, to learn, right? And so he says, if you want to change how you see your problems, all you need to do is change on where you place your values. So stop sh- stop choosing shitty values and choose values which actually are going to mean something um, in the long term. Mm. So it's 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 a lot it's a lot to unpack, but I think it's a, it's a really really um um a really really good book because it goes against the grain. You know, most self help books tell you what you should do and, and how you should go, and you're reading this thinking it sounds like the opposite, but actually it's not. No, that's dope. Yeah, I am. Um... I, I so I read that as well, P, a few months ago, and I really, really loved it because of the fact that exactly how you're saying it's so opposite to all the other stuff that you read. And I actually love the front cover. If any of the listeners are interested, it's a bright orange book, and you will never miss it if you walk past the bookshop. It clearly gets your attention. So the author's been very smart with that. I think the P, especially the point that you were saying about reframing the question of why are you really willing to sacrifice to get to where you want to be? And that is such a good question. Yeah. Such a good question. I remember reading that and I was trying to answer to myself, okay, so yeah, everyone wants to have the house. Everyone wants to have the car, but what are you really willing to give up? Are you willing to sacrifice relationships with your friends? Are you mm-hmm. willing to sacrifice a sleep, like sleeping hardly ever? Are you willing to sacrifice missing birthdays on weekends for friends? Are you willing to sacrifice to miss celebrations or whatever these are questions that if you if people were really asking these questions then that can really frame where your success will lie because if you're not really willing to sacrifice a lot then everything else is just air that you're talking about really so that i i that i love that question when i read yeah. it it's well. funny you mentioned that well because it ties into saying like really around people's problems everyone's got problems yeah. my problem is different from your problem and it's like automatically people have that envious sort of view of like oh that person's so rich oh that person's got this nice car but are you like you mentioned willing to sacrifice and have their problems and switch their problems for your problems because your not problem even... might be i'm thinking about what my how much i can what next holiday i can take with my family theirs might be thinking mm. about okay i've got ten thousand employees and i don't want them to get laid off both of you got different problems it's just like 
are you willing to have their problems? But it's not even about the problems. You look at someone else's life or you you look at what someone may have achieved in their life, but you don't know the struggle they've been through. You mm. often see the, the fruit of what they've been through, the outcome, but you don't know, like, like I was saying, the steep, the snipes. You don't know the struggles they went through, what they had to sacrifice to get to, to where they are now. Mm. People aren't made overnight. It takes a long, long time. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It's a process that people take to what you see where they are today for example where we all are today it didn't just happen by night it's like well like we said it's four years of university to start off with it's years of constant learning to better ourselves to improve ourselves to learn new skills to develop existing skills etc mm. to be where we are now and that's mm. going to continue because i see life as a con- as a continuous yeah. op- op- um, continuous time to continue learning mm. you never stop learning you know, one thing I say is the day I stop learning is the day I die. Exactly. Because I don't think I'm And we ever hope that's not anytime soon. We hope that's yeah, a, just coming. Agree, but, <laughs> but yeah, but it's just, you know, people like to say, oh, you know, I see, I see you're doing well. They see things on, mm. you know, Instagram. But remember, Instagram, you share the success. You don't necessarily share the failures. Exactly. Or you, share the, fa- or you yeah. share the failure along with the success. Like, you wouldn't say, oh, I've been in, I'm downbeat today. I've lost this, I've lost that. You would share that when you've probably got a job or you waited for the outcome you've been hoping for. What stuck out, what, was, what stood out for me was that for it, for what he he framed it as happiness is in solving problems, right? Mm. And another thing I thought was interesting, he says that you, you need to, and it goes back to where you place your values. So, in, in the case of material success, and and it's fine, it's fine to want uh, material items for success, but he says be careful because you may spend twenty years trying to work um, towards that big house and that car which is the problem you're trying to solve. And once you've solved it, you then almost have nothing else to solve or live for. Mm. And so it's, it's going back to Daniel, it's that continuous process of learning and and, and uh, just putting yourself in a position to try and solve more problems, right? Doing what, you, doing what you love every single day versus trying to maybe see an end point because you may get there and find, oh, actually, I enjoyed trying to get here and now I'm here, it's, it's very short-lived. No, I think it's a great it's a great book, P, that you suggested because when I was reading it, the biggest thing that really when I was reading it, I closed the book and I was thinking, Oh my god, this is speaking to me so much is so Mark Manson when he was growing up, he was in his twenties, he was single, he was travelling a lot, having tons of fun. Yeah. And then he got to the stage where he was travelling to like his fifty second or fifty third country and the fun from going to a new country just wasn't as exciting anymore. And during that whole time where he was travelling a lot, he was single and having a lot of fun and then in the end all the stuff that he used to enjoy on you like going out with different people meeting new people going for dinner going here and there that stuff also didn't become any fun anymore and he realized that for him the next chapter of growth was the whole concept of staying in one place or staying with one person something which he was really trying to avoid he realized he needed to enter that next chapter of growth in his life by moving more towards the areas that he was scared of so when I read that, I was thinking, wow, this really resonates for me because I've got to a stage where I've been fortunate to have traveled and lived in different places. But now, for example, I'm in uh, Morocco. This is the first time I've been to Morocco. Am I as excited now to be in Morocco versus when I went to country number 10 or country number 11? Probably not. Sounds um, like you're slowing down, bro. And, yeah, honestly, it is. And then I was, and then, <laughs> Where's the wedding? And when he was talking, <laughs> We're going to get an invitation. And then, and, then, and, then when he, and then when he was saying about the whole, yeah, you know, really enjoying that independent life, like I've been fortunate enough to have lived a full life as well. But I'm getting similar to the stage where, okay, maybe I need to enter that next phase of growth. So that, that was just something that when I read the experience that he was going through that really resonated with me, I was completely blown away by how, how much it spoke to me. And I think, for example, P, in your case, you've obviously married recently etc you're in a different stage but i was just that's something that resonated with me a lot and i thought wow it's a, it's a great book you guys ready for that wedding invitation yeah sounds like she yeah, was gonna coming, be it's coming. <laughs> selling now it's coming i don't know if i'm there yet but i'm close to it anyway oh okay watch this space, <laughs> watch this space. <laughs> just okay. on his instagram page and see what he posts and who he posts, <laughs> who, he posts. Yeah. Yeah. who did he go to morocco with no, 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 no comment, no comment. But let's carry on. <laughs> it's a solo trip. <laughs> more to come, more to Independent come. Independent research, Daniel. <laughs> uh, P, I have a question for you. So after reading that book, was there anything that you thought you could, was there anything that you wanted to reframe or change in 
your day-to-day, your lifestyle, or even thinking after reading it? Yes, yeah, a good question. Um, because it, because it's quite an impactful book. I'll be honest yeah. with you. I, I'm still in that process of of seeing um, what I actually want to take and put into action. I think I think overall you do. So what I, one thing I have taken into taken into pieces is trying to detach uh, my happiness from the outcome, right? And so yeah. we, I, I always say to myself, once once I like, for example, the position I'm in now, right? I, I, I thought about this position years ago, and now I'm in this position. It's a great position to be in, in terms of just life and everything else, but that's the, the whole point is that you continuously um, just trying to detach your, your happiness from the outcome. So just looking at life as a continuous process where you're solving problems, providing value, being useful to others, um, and everything that you want comes along in the journey, but not necessarily parking yourself along and saying, okay, this is what I want. I'm going to be happy when all of this happens. So I think I think that's perhaps I've heard it before, but I think this book has really helped to sort of resonate um, um, with me on that on that point. Yeah, I think. And, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then and then uh, just two two other things I mentioned. I think choosing your struggle that is okay, that is okay. as we mentioned. I looking at looking at now what I want in life and attaching what pain am I likely to go through in order to, in order to have it and actually. In some cases, I probably said to myself, is that really worth um, um, going through? Do I really want to pay that price? For example, um, sometimes I, I think to myself, wouldn't it be cool to take a company public? And I think to myself, yeah. what price do I have to pay in order for that to be achieved? And yeah. so it's, it's do you want that? And um, uh, yeah, those are probably the two two key things that I probably put into action straight away. Okay, so thank you very much for listening to episode number two. We really appreciate we really appreciate all the support. As we're continuing, it'll be great to get your feedback as we continue to put out more content and improve week over week. Um, we'll really like to hear some of the topics you guys would like us to discuss. Talk to you later. Have a great rest, great of, the rest of the week and take care. Thanks. Take off, take flight with you. Before we 